cool that we have Dr. Rebecca Vilbro with us. She's a data scientist, Python programmer, teacher, and author. She's also CTO of Rotational Labs, and she specializes in machine learning and APIs for distributed data systems. She's conducted research on natural language processing, semantic network extraction, entity resolution, and high dimensional information visualization, and is an active open source contributor. She earned her doctorate in writing studies from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where her research centered on communication and visualization and engineering. She went on to study and teach data science, data science at Georgetown, and she creates spaces in a tech world that are affirmative, especially for women. So I'm really excited that we have her with us to think about AI from a different perspective than we have sort of in-house. Thank you so much, Jenny. I am like thrilled to be able to speak to a interdisciplinary audience. Um, you know, you, you can imagine it's been probably 15 years since the last time I gave an academic talk. Mm -hmm. So bear with me. Um, <laughs> uh, but in the intervening years, like since I since I left academia, um, as Jenny said, I've sort of gravitated into the tech world into um, kind of the dawn of data science, which happened in the early 2010s, back back long, long ago, <laughs> in the early 2010s, uh, when the field of data science started to emerge. Actually, it was mostly like renegade PhDs who couldn't find jobs. Um, so mostly from, you know, engineering uh, couldn't find jobs and kind of formed this uh, discipline that was sort of like part math and statistics and part programming and then you know, took advantage of the fact that a lot of new hardware uh, and software kind of uh, compute power was available on the market um, for cheap or for open source for, for almost free. Uh, this phrase, the human in the loop or a human in the loop comes from my world. I'm not sure if it's something that um, people outside of tech use uh, as a term, but in the kind of machine learning world, we use this uh, phrase to sort of talk about times when human intervention is required mm -hmm. in the in a data pipeline. So when you're building something or deploying some kind of data product, um, the places where there is a human in the loop are places where you need maybe the the some kind of human review of the the data, mm -hmm. or maybe um, some kind of checking of the predictions that the model is producing to to do some kind of auditing um, and make sure that things are working as expected. Mm -hmm. And so I want to play with this idea of the human in the loop a little bit in this talk mm -hmm. and talk about what that means to me and has meant to me in my career and maybe to uh, brainstorm with all of you uh, what that might mean for all of you who are coming from maybe kind of humanities, social sciences, uh, maybe a, a different tradition um, than the discipline that I'm mostly situated in right now. Let's start with a game. So hands up. <laughs> Let's do this together. You need two. So put a finger down if you have used AI in some way to help you do something that you didn't feel like doing, like uh, like it could be chat autocomplete on your phone or like email autocomplete or maybe, you know, doing something with homework evaluation or something like that, okay? Uh, put a finger down if you've heard a professor or colleague express concerns about students using AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, put a finger down if you suspect that AI can do at least part of your job. Mm -hmm. Put a finger down if you feel a little personally threatened by ChatGPT. Put a finger down if you know somebody who's been struggling to find a job for more than three months, which is usually like unemployment, you know, when unemployment runs out, at least in North Carolina where I'm from. Put a finger down if you have a close friend or family member that got laid off in the last year. Put a finger down if you worry about the job market <laughs> in your future. Put a finger down if you feel like your apps <laughs> are kind of spying on you. They are. <laughs> Put a finger down if you think about the algorithm at least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and put a, put a finger down if you feel a little bit anxious about the future of humanity. That's all my fingers and all my toes. It's <laughs> all of my it's all of my fingers too. So I just I want you to know that I want you to know that we're starting from a place where all of my fingers are down too. Okay. So I I studied and I was very interested with how engineers acquire literacy, like engineering literacy, through things like coding and data visualization. Um, and uh, when I actually first started, so um, I started grad school in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I started, uh, I, you know, I showed up on campus and I, like everybody that I met, I very proudly told them that I was a double major as an undergrad in math and English. <laughs> and I would sort of wait for people to be very impressed mm -hmm. by this fact. And I thought like it really distinguished me. And at some point people were like, oh, there's another, another <laughs> woman in our program who just started, who also was a math and English major. And I said, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> and I felt very threatened, honestly, mm -hmm. if I'm honest, I felt, well, well, the thing that I thought made me special maybe is not so special after all. And you might or might not know that that person who so intimidated me <laughs> um, is your very own Professor Lieberman. Um, and she really gave me a run for my money. And I generally, we sort of have this idea that the, uh, the arts, the humanities, and that the sciences are diametrically opposed and that they repel each other. There's some sort of magnetic thing that pushes them apart. Um, and you know this has been true for a long time. Uh, back in 1959, a uh, British scientist and novelist named C.P. Snow mm -hmm. gave a lecture at Cambridge that's now called the Two Cultures Lecture. So um, but the, the lecture is about how worried he is that the, the literary intellectuals and the scientists aren't friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's very concerned that this is gonna impact society's ability to apply technology to solve the world's problems. And so he says, um, he's talking about how he goes to these parties and he's at parties with these literary intellectuals and they're talking about how illiterate the scientists are. And sometimes he'll get mad mm -hmm. and he'll say, oh yeah, like describe the second law of thermodynamics. And they'll just be like, who cares about that? You know, and, he, and they're so kind of derisive mm -hmm. about this. Um, and he's, you know, he's saying, that's the same as saying that I've never read Shakespeare or maybe that I don't even know how to read. Mm -hmm. um, and he's worried because he says, the great edifice of modern, modern physics goes up and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world have about as much insight into that as their Neolithic ancestors would have had. And I think the thing that's crazy about this is that he's living in a time when the humanities were seen as dominant mm -hmm. and the science, sciences were subordinate uh, in terms of like what people thought was intellectual mm -hmm. and smart at the time. And that is so different <laughs> from how we see things now. Uh -huh. um, but it's sort of fascinating to, to imagine like 1959, um, not that long ago, you know, it's co completely opposite to I think how it feels now. But I think that he was right to worry because I think that even though there's been this sort of flip and maybe the, we sort of see science as, you know, stronger, um, better funded, of course, and and um, you know, th there is this sense that like the alienation between the two cultures is going to start to cause real problems and is maybe already causing some real problems. And I don't want to sweep that under the rug and kind of give like a rah-rah technology talk and get you all on board with AI, um, because I think that we want to like acknowledge the reality of how it actually feels to be living in this world where, you know, these collisions are happening and we don't really have a way to have a, a real conversation a real interdisciplinary conversation about it. <clears throat> this is my team mm -hmm. at Rotational Labs. So I have a company, I'm the CTO. Um, I get to decide which engineers I hire. And so they're all different kinds of folks, um, all different ages, all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and that's who I wanna surround my, myself with. And that's the kind of work that I wanna build. That's kind of the kind of software I wanna write. Um, and this is the kind of people that I wanna work with. Um, and I'm proud of my team. And so two years ago, I paid an artist mm -hmm. to draw pictures of all of us to put on our website, a human artist. Mm -hmm. These were made by a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, although actually, I hear that that is uh, redundant now, mm -hmm. because actually, according to a US court, you cannot make art if you are an AI, mm -hmm. um, because you are not a you. 
um, and only uh, the only real art that can be like copyrighted is human art. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, that was decided, I think, in like August mm -hmm. of last year. Um, so that's kind of interesting. That's like definitely something's happening. Um, you know, there's definitely something changing. You know, I think it's a little too late, though, <laughs> for a lot of, you know, copyright issues. Um, because the big kind of generative AI models that are out there on the market uh, probably have violated a significant amount of copyright in order to produce the models that they are now offering and, and getting money, um, making a lot of money on. Um, and, you know, there are some kind of court proceedings that are in play. I don't know how they will turn out. Um, but, you know, some of these big uh, AI companies um, might have to at some point answer for, for what they've done, or they might figure out a way around it. Um, but this has really got my attention. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I am starting to think about whether or not my work can be replaced by AI. And I want to say that out loud, um, because I think that probably for, for people who teach things like, you know, writing, or he, even people who teach anything where students have to write essays, there's probably been kind of a crisis of confidence in the last couple of years, you know, as it becomes like harder and harder to tell how hard your students are working to learn things, because we're used to using things like essays to measure that, and maybe we can't fully use that in the same way that we've been used to. Um, but I'm also worried that the work that I do, I, I build machine learning models. I do data science, like I build AI. Can I be replaced also by AI? Can my team be replaced? And it's not, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. And here's why. So in the, uh, in the very olden days, like the late 1900s, <laughs> um, it was like machine learning was the uh, property of the ivory tower. Um, machine learning was something that happened in universities and the people who would implement it would be graduate students who were, you know, studying epidemiology or statistics or something like that. And they would use something like Fortran or mm -hmm. Java or something like that. And they would kind of cobble together some kind of machine learning algorithm, implement it kind of all by themselves, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of lines of code just to do their research to publish so that they could graduate, you know, you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and like nobody would read that code probably, um, you know, unless maybe their dissertation advisor did, but she, we all know. So it might take, you know, years and years to implement a single machine learning algorithm. And then in like 2009 or 2010, um, everything changed. So there was a group of uh, French graduate students who got together and they each came from like slightly different disciplines but had all worked in implementing their own machine learning models in graduate school. And they got together and they figured out how to build a unified API. API stands for Application Programming Interface. Just think interface, right? Like a, a unified interface for machine learning. And they published it uh, open source, which means that it was not only open source for everybody to read, so it was okay for anybody to read it, it was also okay for anybody to use it. Um, so you could use it to build, uh, you know, customer facing products with, um, and you could use it to make money um, because they published it using an open source license that was very permissive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which means that now you can train like 60 different machine learning models with just a few, like less than 10 lines of code. And you know, I don't expect anybody to, to read Python fluently, but I'll sort of tell you what's important here. Um, so this list here of the classifiers, these are different algorithms. And each one of these lines represents like four years of work for one graduate student probably, right? So that's like, so maybe k-nearest neighbors classifier is an algorithm that takes all of the data that you have and projects it into space and then decides what's important by looking at the points that are near each other in space. So that algorithm works completely differently from the one on the next line. Mm -hmm. So SVC stands for support vector classifier. So support vector machines do something totally different with the data. 
they take all the points and project it into higher dimension. So they increase the dimensionality to try to find separations between data that would otherwise not be separable. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different algorithm. But you can do both of them with like just a few lines of code. And that's wild. Um, and this has been true for about 15 years now. And so maybe it should have come as no surprise to me when uh, it started kind of, I started hearing that it was possible to do machine learning with no code at all. So you don't even need 10 lines. Maybe you don't even have to know any code at all. You don't need to know any math. You don't need to know any code. You can just kind of log into your interface on you know, your, your computer and click a button and kind of under the hood things will happen and machine learning will happen. And this starts to kind of infringe now on what I think I'm good at um, and sort of suggests that maybe what I thought was special about what I could do is increasingly a little less special. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me a little bit nervous, I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the other hand, you know, in tech, we're sort of like used to the idea that things are always changing and you can never get comfortable and you have this sort of morbid sense of humor about how like how out of date your tools are probably and how much you have to struggle to keep learning the next programming language and the next thing and the next thing. And we kind of have a sense of humor, like a morbid sense of humor about it. This was a little line that we have in the preface of the book that we published. Um, you know, that basically says, uh, you know, to our children, so the book that we wrote is about, you know, predicting with language data. Um, and, you know, to our children, we hope that someday you'll find this book and think, wow, our parents wrote books when computers couldn't talk like a normal person. How old are they? <laughs> this was 2018. Right. And, and now already we live in a completely different world where computers can talk almost like a normal human, right? So maybe, maybe this all just boils down to fear of aging, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, when this sort of age old, uh, old age filter started popping, popping up on social media, um, it made me think about kind of like technology and aging and the idea of like young people exploring, like cosplaying the, their older selves. Um, and this is, you know, obviously Haley Bieber uh, kind of cosplaying her future self. Um, and she's beautiful. <laughs> so if it's going to be like that, I'm not scared at all. Um, uh, but, you know, at some point you do sort of like reach a point where you feel tired, you know, and you're kind of like, gosh, do I have to learn about podcasts or do I have to learn about chat GPT? Like, do I really have to keep learning all these new things to kind of participate in regular society? <clears throat> And it makes me <laughs> it makes me think about a poem that was published like 40 years before C.P. Snow mm -hmm. gave his lecture. Um, this uh, T.S. Eliot poem, the uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is I think about just like that fear that you know becoming irrelevant is inevitable for all of us, and that's certainly how I read it. You know, when I when I read this the first time, this is one of my favorite poems, and I've read it many, many times, starting when I was way too young to really understand what it, it meant at all. And I remember looking up ether, being like, "Ooh, ether, that's interesting." <laughs> um, but uh, you know, he says, "I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? <laughs> Do I dare to eat a peach?" I will wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that I have a slightly different perspective, mm -hmm. which is there's like an element of hope here, which is if it's true that eventually my technology, my ideas will become irrelevant, it's because I'm creating a space for somebody else to come in after me and have an influence and be able to, to have ideas that I don't have yet, that I haven't thought of yet. And maybe I just need to open, be open to that and kind of reconcile myself that it's okay to age out of relevance if it creates a space for people who have energy and ideals 
um, and really have new things that they can bring into the conversation that I can't do by myself, um, things that I wouldn't ever think of. And so I have four kind of key things that I want you to, to walk away from this talk thinking. And the first is that tech is creative. It's not true that the arts and the sciences are two separate things. That's wrong. <laughs> it's never been true. Uh, you know, C.P. Snow was a scientist and a published novelist. And, you know, he had kind of an economic fortune that allowed him to do both of those things that might not be true for all of us now. But it's never been true that there have been two cultures because he is like <laughs> obviously an example of somebody. Jenny and I are examples of people, all of you who are here today, are examples that, you know, it's not actually true that they're separate. Um, and I want to show you kind of some examples of creativity and tech that might kind of inspire you a little bit. So um, the first one is, this is one of my favorite Instagram creators. Uh, her name is Molly. She lives in the Netherlands and she's a data scientist. And what she does is she studies micro trends, uh, micro fashion trends. And so she will, you know, kind of make a video about something and she'll collect all of the comments on the video and do data science on the comments to do like topic analysis, sentiment analysis. Um, and, and so she posted something about fur, like the rise of kind of natural animal fur coming back because she was interested to see if things had shifted enough where like plastic fur is bad for the environment. And yeah, obviously, you know, hurting animals, you know, so there's kind of like some complexity there. So she did a study, you know, a micro study on this micro trend. Um, and then she anticipated what ended up being called the mob wife uh, aesthetic, which has kind of come back. Yeah. Um, but the fur, kind of the fur thing is a, a component of the mob wife mm -hmm. aesthetic. And I think that's such a creative application of data science. She's applying it to something that she is personally very passionate about. She loves fashion. She loves clothes. And um, and I, I think that that is such a beautiful application of the tools that I know how to use. And, I, and I'm sort of constantly impressed and surprised by the content that she makes. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody has read this uh, Paul Graham article called Hackers and Painters, but if you could, uh, it's, it's, you know, been out for 20 years or something. I think it's 2003, so before I even started grad school. Um, uh, but he was a, he is a programmer. He, he started out as a, a programmer, a hacker, and then he ended up wanting to do, uh, to study painting for a while. And people were like, like two cultures, they must feel so different. He's like, actually know that of all of the people that I've ever met, hackers and painters are probably the most um, similar. And I, I, you know, I, I read this article before, um, you know, before I had really figured out what my dissertation was going to be about, um, but it really had an impression on me. And later, um, when I entered tech, the first big success that I had as a technologist was a Python library called Yellowbrick which combines the scikit-learn machine learning API that I showed you a few slides ago that allows you to experiment with a lot of different machine learning models in a few lines of code. It combines that with visualization um, and you can use it for diagnostics. Mm -hmm. So you can teach yourself to understand, even if you don't know everything about every algorithm, because right, it's like years and years of expertise to understand what k-nearest neighbors or support vector machines, how those work. But through visualization, you can get a little bit of insight to understand how different models behave and why one model might be more appropriate for a certain problem than another model. And that's really powerful. And nobody had thought of it before um, because like, it felt crazy to combine visualization with machine learning at the time. And now it's totally, uh, totally normal. I don't know how easy it is to see, but like something like, um, 14,000 people download my package every day, mm -hmm. <laughs> which blows my mind. You know, it says 400 downloads in the last month mm -hmm. of this package. Um, so it really, you know, when you can find ways to pull things together, it can really make a dramatic impact. And I think that kind of combining creativity with tech, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. I also want to suggest, you know, that another takeaway is that we should be looking for patterns. Um, and so this might be a, like a pattern that you are somewhat familiar with, the idea of doing like syntactic trees or syntactic parsing. A lot of people were forced to learn 
English this way. And I'm not, I don't think they teach English this way anymore because it's not always the most fun way to learn English. And also we don't really follow the rules, do we? Mm -hmm. um, but um, this kind of pattern is incredibly powerful if you can harness it, because if you know that certain kinds of things like a combination of a pronoun and a verb signal some kind of important thing in text, you can write a piece of code that will just read just all of the combinations of like a pronoun followed by a verb. And you can do that really fast. Um, and in fact, that was kind of the second big thing that I did um, was I wrote a book called Applied Text Analysis with Python that kind of talked about how to take those patterns from grammar and use them to extract important things from text in an automatic fashion. So you didn't have to read the whole book. You could kind of create a summary um, using kind of statistics and grammar together. And I didn't invent this idea, but um, you know, definitely the idea that you could kind of synthesize this all into a, a pipeline is something that I feel really proud of having found. Um, and I think um, you know, really has uh, kind of influenced uh, for me, my process, and you know, everybody who has kind of taken my classes and and bought the book, I think, are are now kind of thinking about it in this way that there is this sort of routine way of going from the low level of the language, finding the patterns, and then using that to kind of go to the large scale um, patterns. And some of the large scale patterns, you know, allow you to look for um, kind of trends in what people are talking about by being able to kind of move from these kind of rules to these, like finding these big patterns, mm -hmm. you can find all of this interesting structure um, that you couldn't find otherwise. And this has also led me to an idea that, you know, my company is exploring now, which is like a new kind of database um, that exploits some of those uh, observations about patterns in, in language data. So third thing that I want to talk about mm -hmm. is that failure is a, is a good teacher. And I want to kind of talk about some of my failures over time. I don't want to just talk about like all of my my wins. Um, but, you know, I kind of got my start, you know, during a economic recession. <laughs> um, things looked really dire at the time. We were not sure if there would be jobs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us went to school uh, and more school and more school to sort of defer uh, getting a real grown up job. Um, and that was like a, a, a kind of common thing. Um, I went to school and I published um, and I still perished yeah. and ended up, you know, after I finished my PhD, I went in, I left academia and I'm a, you know, became a renegade. Um, so I was trying to find a job. I applied to a hundred jobs in the course of like about 18 months and I was rejected from all of them. <laughs> So it was really, this was like a tough time to find a job. Um, I got a job and was furloughed. <laughs> so I kind of went through this furlough and around this time is when I started to get really uh, much more interested in, in programming mm -hmm. um, and kind of realizing that that was maybe going to help, um, which was great. And I joined a startup and it failed. <laughs> so that didn't work out. Uh, and so I went to another startup and it also failed. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh bad things happened all over the world not just to me but it felt like it was happening uh it felt like failure right you know all uh, everything shut down um you know it was sort of uncertain what was going to happen and i honestly i don't even really know what i'm going to fail at next but i will fail at something next um uh but you know i think that machine learning has sort of taught me that failure is just part of the process mm -hmm. so this is the neural network uh kind of standard uh architecture we start with labeled data. Mm -hmm. We have neurons, um, these purple things in the middle, so these kind of connectors. There are synapses, these little tiny light lines that connect the data and the, the uh, neuron layers. And then on the other side, there are predictions that are going to come out. So here's here, it starts with the what we call feed forward process. So the key thing here is that we are, are there already is a human in the loop here because you you know that like x4 maps to y4 because a human has given you that data and says you know when the input is this the output was this and so you already have data that's been labeled by a human there's already a human in the loop from the very beginning and the goal is for the model to learn some sort of relationship between the inputs 
and the outputs that the human has told them is true from the beginning, right? So signal is gonna get propagated forward. This is called feed forward. And so we move from the input data to the first layer of neurons to the next layer of neurons. And in really big neural networks like ChatGPT, there are many, many, many layers here. Um, so this is sort of kind of simplified a little bit. But we end up with these predictions here, the little hats, the Y hats, we end up with predictions and we can compare those predictions to the answers that we know are true. Why do we know they're true? The human in the loop. Yeah, the human has told us that those are the true answers, so we know which ones are wrong. And then we can back propagate that knowledge back to the beginning. And what happens is we go back and forth until we, we converge or we say stop because we're out of credits on our cloud spend. <laughs> so, you know, we this is called an epoch. So we train in epochs. So every kind of full loop all the way through feed forward all the way back, back propagation is called an epoch. So we train in epochs and we specify some rule to determine how sensitive these neurons should be to the feedback that they get from back propagation. Mm -hmm. If they're too sensitive, you're gonna end up with like a really erratic model that just like jumps all over the place. If they're not sensitive enough, they don't learn fast enough and it takes a really, 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 really long time. And that's super expensive. So you have to kind of pick a good heuristic, but that heuristic is picked by a human in the loop. <clears throat> At the end of the epoch, we compare the expected value to the predicted value and we compute the error. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can use derivatives, you know, all of that code also written by humans. So there's a lot of human in the loop here. Um, and the other thing that humans are critical for uh, being in the loop is that even if we do a good job with that process of feed forward and back propagation, we have a high probability of ending up in a local maximum or a local minimum, which means we haven't actually found the optimal solution. We found something that's like better than the worst solution, but is not the best solution. And it's really hard with just algorithms alone to find the global minimum or the global maximum. Usually you need a human in the loop. Interestingly, Snyder's hope theory, I don't know if anybody has studied hope theory. This like chart looks super familiar now, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like humans work similarly, um, you know, the way that we kind of uh, uh, form ideas, the way that we decide how much agency we have reminds me a little bit of how sensitive the neurons need to be in order to optimally create a system. So maybe we can think about how sensitive our neurons are are they optimally sensitive to kind of reinforce not only learning in the acute sense, but also a sense of agency in a global sense? And if you feel like you're too sensitive and it's kind of interrupting your, your feeling of human agency, you might need to try to tune the knob a little bit um, because if you don't feel like you have agency, it's gonna be hard to do anything. <clears throat> okay, last thing. You gotta be silly sometimes, you gotta play. Mm -hmm. I loved this trend on social media. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, there was this song that came out as um, kind of elements of the song was really cool. And so at the same time, this filter came out that was like this generative AI filter where you could hold up some steak sauce and like a spatula and it would try to interpolate the, what you were actually showing it into some kind of like, you know, post-apocalyptic warrior goddess kind of thing. And I thought it was so fun. And I love that people were playing with it and they, they were trying to break the AI. Mm -hmm. And that spirit of like, their first instinct was to like break it and mess around with it. That gives me hope. I think that that's important. You know, there's something really good about that. Um, and it's really interesting that I, you know, I think, well, probably this is true of many TikTok trends, but it started with African-American mm -hmm. uh, creators. <clears throat> Let me introduce you to the, uh, the interns and the students of Rotational. These are the people who have helped us remember to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, this is a little bit like that idea of, you know, maybe starting to relinquish some of the control we have, you know, to make a little bit of room 
for new ideas and new voices and or at least kind of giving them a little bit more room to break the rules because maybe that is just the natural progression of things and we shouldn't fight it too hard. Um, in particular, I wanna talk about Nabiha who is a video game freak. Like she is obsessed with video games and she loves them so much. Um, and now uh, she is uh, working on using large language models to create more interesting NPC characters in video games. Um, it's a super cool project. If anybody's interested, um, ping me and I'll, I'll, I can send you kind of like a demo or something, but it's such a cool idea. Um, and, you know, it's really kind of coming from a place of like love and play um, and fun. And I think that it's really refreshing. And she came and gave this talk um, to my engineering team and everybody, you know, was totally blown away. Super creative, really excellent application of, of these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, I'm not an economist. Um, you know, I'm not going to kind of claim uh, that I can defend any of these kind of uh, these theories uh, or necessarily espouse them. But I'll say, like, it's certainly I'm not the first person to say maybe you got to break stuff to make stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this idea that maybe we need to, like, allow for creative destruction, you know, certainly our government is kind of structured in a way um, where, like, as as there's more regulation, maybe we create more kind of like systematicity, but maybe we make it harder for the natural process of creative destruction. And as people who are educators or kind of in a position where we make make kind of reinforce rules and stuff like that, you know, kind of figuring out how to create a little bit of space for creative destruction maybe is what we are supposed to be doing. Um, so coming back to uh, T.S. Eliot and, and the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, um, if you find yourself, you know, kind of feeling like these eyes have like fixed you in a formulated phrase, you are in your discipline, you're not supposed to go outside your lines, you know, you're just supposed to do what they're telling you to do or what people expect from you, and it's left you feeling like the patient who is etherized upon the table, and you're wondering, do I dare, do I dare, do I dare disturb the universe? Um, I think the answer is yes, but thank you very much. Mm -hmm.